Hello and welcome to my channel and welcome to this week's Wednesday interlude in which I shine the spotlight on D.H. Lawrence. David Herbert Lawrence was born on the 11th of September 1885 in Eastwood in Nottinghamshire in the north of England. Lawrence was both a writer and a poet. His collected works represent, among other things, an extended reflection upon the dehumanising effects of modernity and industrialisation. Some of the issues Lawrence explores are sexuality, emotional health, vitality, spontaneity and instinct. As well as novels and poetry, Lawrence wrote short stories, essays, travel books, non-fiction and translated works. Lawrence was also an artist and left behind a considerable b b body of work. Lawrence's opinions earned him many enemies and he endured official persecution, censorship and misrepresentation of his creative work throughout the second half of his life, much of which he spent in a voluntary exile he called his savage pilgrimage. Lawrence was the fourth child of Arthur John Lawrence, a barely literate miner at Brinsley Colliery, and Lydia Beardsall, a former pupil teacher who had been forced to perform manual work in a lace factory due to her family's financial difficulties. Lawrence spent his formative years in the coal mining town of Eastwood, Nottinghamshire. The house in which he was born, 8A Victoria Street, is now the D. H. Lawrence Birthplace Museum. His working class background and the tensions between his parents provided the raw material for a number of his early works. From an early age Lawrence roamed the open hilly country and remaining fragments of Sherwood Forest in Felly Woods to the north of Eastwood beginning a lifelong appreciation of the natural world and he often wrote about the country of my heart as a setting for much of his fiction. Lawrence contracted tuberculosis and during a period of convalescence he often visited Hag's farm, the home of the Chambers family, and began a friendship with Jesse Chambers. An important aspect of this relationship with Chambers was a shared love of books, an interest that lasted throughout Lawrence's life. During his early years as a pupil teacher in Nottingham, he was working on his first poems, some short stories, and a draft of a novel, Letitia, which was eventually to become The White Peacock. At the end of 1907, he won a short story competition in the Nottinghamshire Guardian, the first time that he had gained any wider recognition for his literary talents. In the autumn of 1908, the newly qualified Lawrence left his childhood home for London. While teaching in Davidson Road School, Croydon, he continued writing. J Jesse Chambers submitted some of Lawrence's early work, sorry, early poetry, to Ford Maddox Ford, then known as Ford Herman Huffer, editor of the influential The English Review. Huffer then commissioned the story Odour of Chrysanthemums, which, when published in that magazine, encouraged Heinemann, a London publisher, to ask Lawrence for more work. His career as a professional author now began in earnest, although he taught for another year. Shortly after the final proofs of his first published novel, The White Peacock, appeared in 1910, Lawrence's mother died of cancer. The young man was devastated, and he was to describe the next few months as his sick year. It is clear that Lawrence had an extremely close relationship with his mother and his grief became a major turning point in his life, just as the death of Mrs. Morell is a major turning point in his autobiographical novel Sons and Lovers, a work that draws upon much of the writer's provincial upbringing. Essentially concerned with the emotional b b battle for Lawrence's love between his mother and Miriam, in reality Jesse Chambers, the novel also documents Paul's, that is Lawrence's, brief intimate relationship with Miriam, Jesse, 
that Lawrence had finally initiated in the Christmas of 1909, ending it in August 1910. The hurt caused to Jessie by this and finally by her portrayal in the novel caused the end of their friendship and after it was published they never spoke to each other again. In 1911 Lawrence was introduced to Edward Garnett, a publisher's reader who acted as a mentor, provided further encouragement and became a valued friend as did his son David. Throughout these months, the young author revised Paul Morell, the first draft of what became Sons and Lovers. In November 1911, he came down with pneumonia again. Once he recovered, Lawrence decided to abandon teaching in order to become a full-time writer. In February 1912, he broke off an engagement to Louis B -B Burroughs, an old friend from his days in Nottingham and Eastwood. In March 1912, Lawrence met Frieda Weekly, née von Richthofen, with whom he was to share the rest of his life. Six years older than her new lover, she was married to Ernest Weekly, his former modern languages professor at University College Nottingham, and had three young children. She eloped with Lawrence to her parents' home in Metz, a garrison town then in Germany near the disputed border with France. Their stay there included Lawrence's first encounter with tensions between Germany and France when he was arrested and accused of being a British spy before being released following an intervention from Frieda's father. After this incident, Lawrence left for a small hamlet of the south of Munich where he was joined by Frieda for their honeymoon. Later memorialised in the series of love poems titled Look, We Have Come Through, published in 1917. During 1912, Lawrence wrote the first of his so-called mining plays, The Daughter-in-Law, written in Nottingham dialect. The play was never to be performed or even published in Lawrence's lifetime. Lawrence and Frieda went to live in Italy. It was here that he started writing the first draft of a work of fiction that was to be transformed into two of his best-known novels, The Rainbow and Women in Love in which unconventional female characters take centre stage. Both novels were highly controversial and both were banned on publication in the UK for obscenity. Women in Love only temporarily. Both novels cover grand themes and ideas. The Rainbow follows three generations of a Nottinghamshire farming family from the pre-industrial to the industrial age, focusing particularly, particularly on a a daughter, Ursula, and her aspiration for a more fulfilling life than that of becoming a housebound wife. Women in Love delves into the complex relationships between four major characters, including the sisters Ursula and Gudrun. Both novels challenge conventional ideas about the arts, politics, economic growth, gender, sexual experience, friendship, and marriage and can be seen as far ahead of their time. The frank and relatively straightforward manner in which Lawrence dealt with sexual attraction was ostensibly what got the books banned. Eventually, eventually Frieda obtained her divorce. The couple returned to Britain shortly before the outbreak of World War I and were married on the 13th of July 1914. The Rainbow published in 1915, was suppressed after an instigation investigation into its alleged obscenity. Later they were accused of spying and signalling to German submarines off the coast of Cornwall where they lived at Zeno. During this period he finished writing Women in Love. Not published until 1920, it is now widely recognised as an English novel of great dramatic force and intellectual subtlety. Lawrence is best known for his novels Sons and Lovers, The Rainbow, Women in Love and Lady Chatterley's Lover. My two favourites are Sons and Lovers and The Rainbow. In these books, Lawrence explores the possibilities for life within an industrial setting. In particular, Lawrence is concerned with the nature of relationships that can be had within such a setting. Though often classed as a realist, Lawrence, in fact, uses his characters to give form to his personal philosophy. His depiction of sexuality, though seen as shocking when his work was first published in the early 
21st century has its roots in this highly personal way of thinking and being. It is worth noting that Ross was very interested in the sense of touch and that his focus on physical intimacy has its roots in a desire to restore an emphasis on the b body and rebalance it with what he perceived to be Western civilization's overemphasis on the mind. At the time of his d d d d d d d death, however, his public reputation was that of a pornographer who had wasted his considerable talents. Ian Forster, in an obituary notice, challenged this widely held view, describing him as the greatest imaginative novelist of our generation. Later, the literary critic F. R. Leavis championed both his artistic integrity and his moral seriousness. D. H. Lawrence died from tuberculosis in France on the 2nd of March 1930 at the age of 44. In this brief introduction, I can only hit some of the highlights, but if you'd like to discover more about D. H. Lawrence's life and work, there are several biographies to choose from. I have read The Priest of Love by Harry T. Moore, which is a detailed and thorough biography of, Nod of Lawrence. A portrait of the Genius by Richard Aldington. D. H. Lawrence, a personal record by Jesse Chambers, which I adored when I first read it in my twenties. Not I, but The Wind by Frieda Lawrence, which is um, included in Frieda Lawrence by Rosie Jackson. I also own D. H. Lawrence Novelist by F. R. Leavis. And I see from my bookmark <laughs> that I've only read 88 pages of 377. So I don't think I was very impressed if I stopped reading. So I, I will try it again someday. I currently own nine works by Lawrence and his collected short stories. But in my 20s, I read everything I could get my hands on by Lawrence, so I've probably read everything worth reading written by him. In the resources section below, you will find links to Project Gutenberg of several of his works. Let me know in the comments below if you've read any of Gage Lawrence's works and what you thought of them. So that's all folks, but I'll be back soon with another booktube video.